Welcome, everyone. I hope you all are having a good evening and holiday. My name is Nick Valeski, and I work for our Utah State University Extension Integrated Pest Management Program. And I'm the one that's been coordinating these vegetable IPM winter webinar series. And this year's series, we've been focusing it toward our commercial farmers and our small urban farmers here in Utah, but a lot of homeowners and home gardeners as well can get a lot of great information from these. So tonight's webinar, we're gonna be covering specific, or I guess just not specific, but more common diseases and insect pests of onion crops. So as a quick reminder, you guys are watching a Zoom webinar. So you will not have access to your camera or microphone. However, you guys are more than welcome and encouraged to leave comments and questions in the Zoom chat box. And this webinar, it's gonna be recorded as well. So if you missed it, or if you wanna come back and watch it, it'll be available on our Extension YouTube channel along with our Extension Utah Pest website. So now I'm gonna give the time over to Dr. Claudia Nishua. All right, so I'll be talking about common onion diseases and uh, allium leaf miner at the end. That's the other problem I'm gonna talk about in Utah onions today. So we'll start out with Botrytis neck rot. It's caused by two species of Botrytis, Botrytis acleida and Botrytis allii. There are other Botrytis species that you can find on onions, but they do cause other diseases and we rarely see them in Utah. But Botrytis neck rot in some years can be very prevalent. The fungus usually infects onions around 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the field, but you will never see symptoms in the field. The spores and other survival structures survive in the soil. That's where the plants become infected. An infection occurs during moist, cool weather, but they stay latent. So the cells will be infected but the fungus is just gonna sit there and wait. You will not see any symptoms whatsoever on your onions. The infection gets going when the necks are not dry before onions are placed in storage. Once the cells die in the neck and they're still moist, the fungus will take over and colonize that tissue and then migrate into the bulb. And symptoms usually develop within four to six weeks once the onions are in storage. Most of the time you see a yield loss of about 30%, but I've seen 100% of storage onions being lost to the disease. And so here you can see some pictures and I don't know if my cursor is actually visible to everybody. Okay, thanks, it is. So. Botrytis necrot will always start in the neck and go from the top down. And eventually it will infect the entire bulb. Sometimes you can see masses of spores on the outside on the top of the bulb, but oftentimes you will only see symptoms once you actually cut that bulb open. To manage Botrytis necrot, it's, it's very easy to control, but you have to be patient. You need to wait until the necks are dry before you remove the leaves and place the onions into storage. So if you have an onion that's still green, you had it undercut and you top it immediately. Oops, let me go back. There's supposed to be something flying in, but I guess there it is. Um, you do not want to do that. You will get Botrytis necrot. You want to wait until the leaves are dry, dead, and this area around the neck has dried up as well before you cut the, the leaves off and place the onions in storage. In most years when we do see a big problem, it's when there's an early frost predicted and growers harvest real quick and don't wait until the onions have dried down enough before they place them in storage. We do have a fact sheet on the Utah Plant Pest Diagnostic website on Botrytis necra that will provide additional information. 
but there's no chemical control for it since normally you can control it very easily with just um, cultural management options. Another fungus we see is Fusarium basal rod. It's caused by Fusarium oxysporum forma specialis sepa. So there's several forma specialis or strains of Fusarium oxysporum and they're very host specific. The one that goes to onions will only go to re other related hosts like garlic and chives and shallots. It will not go to tomatoes or it will not go to melons. Those are other Fusarium oxysporum strains that go to these uh, vegetables. Their optimum temperature is 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit for infection. The above ground symptoms you see will be yellowing of leaves, wilting and leaf necrosis. The roots will be rotting and so the onions can't take up water or nutrients. That's what leads to yellowing of the leaves, dying of leaves and wilting. If you cut the bulb open, you see discoloration of the tissue and sometimes the bulbs look kind of watery. And in contrast to Botrytis neck rot, Fusarium basal rot will always start on the bottom of the bulb at the basal end and then move up into the bulb. And then on the right here, you can see some pictures or a picture of what the symptoms look like above ground. Now these symptoms are very non-specific. They could apply to several other diseases as well as some insect damage as well. So it's important that you would pull out a symptomatic onion, look on the bottom and see if there's no roots. If there's no roots, you might want to take a strong hand lens and look for bulb mites. And I'm not sure if Nick's going to talk about bulb mites tonight. Okay, um, I might add that a little bit without I don't have any pictures, but I can talk about it a little bit. Um, management for fusarium basal rot, crop rotation for at least four years if you had a problem with it. It's a soil borne fungus. So you have it present in the soil. After four years, you reduce the inoculum enough that you can grow onions for several years before you have to do rotations as well. There are onion varieties that have some resistance to fusarium basal rot. So that would be another option if you had problems with it. And storing of onions at 39 degrees or less will reduce the amount of rot you get in storage if you would have infected onions. Black mold caused by Aspergillus niger. Aspergillus niger is a fairly common mold. You can find it on many vegetables including onions. It survives on dead plant material. The spores are in the soil as well as airborne. Optimum temperature for infection is 82 to 93 degrees Fahrenheit, so it likes it hot. The symptoms you see on onions is black discoloration in the neck area, dark lesions with spores developing under the outer scales. And sometimes you can mistake black mold for smut. It's another fungus that we rarely see in Utah. If we do see it, so far I've only seen it on white onions. But you do need a microscope to distinguish between the two because you have to look at the spores. And the black mold can also cause a bulb rot. So here on the right, you can see the spores, spore masses that are produced under the outer scale. And then in here, you on the left side, you can see the bulb rod that's starting from the side going inward. And these lesions have thousands of spores, each single lesion, there's, there's thousands of spores that could then infect another onion bulb. So to manage black mold, you want to prevent wounding or bruising of onions as these could be entrance points for the mold. Store bulbs below 59 degrees Fahrenheit. However, if you have infected bulbs or bulbs that carry the spores and you transport them long distance at high temperatures, the fungus will resume its growth. Last week, I was asked about pink spots on white onions. 
there's two potential causes. One is pinking, that's a response during harvest when onions get bruised. And you can sort of see that light pink spot here in the middle. The other cause is a species of Fusarium, Fusarium proliferatum that can cause that. The spots are usually confined to the outer dry scales. And occasionally Fusarium proliferatum will cause a bulb rot, but most of the time it also just stays in those outer scales. So if you take this outer scale off, the onion underneath looks perfectly fine. I did incubate one of these onions at warm temperatures with a moist paper towel to really try and get the fusarium going if it was there. It's been a week now and nothing has happened. The onion bulb is still perfectly fine after taking that outer scale off. It requires a little bit of work, but that's all you would have to do and your onion would be fine to sell. I'm moving a little bit up to foliar diseases of onions. There's purple blotch caused by Alternaria pori. Alternate hosts are leek and garlic. The symptoms usually start with the oldest leaves. And you see lens shaped lesions that I have a purple discoloration. That's where the name comes from. It looks very similar to another um, foliar disease caused by different fungus I'm gonna talk about in a minute but how you can distinguish the two if you don't have a microscope to look at the spores is to watch for that purple discoloration. And sometimes you get concentric rings of black spores. And if you have a strong hand lens, you can see the spores. They're club shaped and they're fairly large. So you can actually see them with a hand lens. The leaves will turn brown and dry up, which can result in a undersized bulb. Once the leaves are dry, these particular leaves will not support the scales in the onion bulb anymore. So there's no more size increasement. And in severe cases, you can get 100% yield loss depending on the bulb size that your customers are looking for. So here you can see a lesion of purple blotch and in this picture the purple discoloration doesn't come out quite as well. And then on here on the right we have a severe case of, of purple blotch and you can see all the lesions. The environmental conditions for purple blotch 77 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit high humidity either from rain or irrigation especially if you have like sprinkler irrigation even flood irrigation if the bulb if the onions are close together and you have very high humidity for 12 to 16 hours. The fungus overwinters in crop debris and on the soil surface and the spores are dispersed by wind and rain. Disease development it usually takes about two to four days after the infection before you see spores uh, symptoms develop and then you get spore development about five days after the symptoms develop. Alternaria could be seed transmitted, so you want to buy disease-free seed. Good weed control to increase air movement between the onions, crop rotation for at least three years, and maintain vigorous plants. Stress plants seem to be more susceptible. Last year, I saw a lot of purple blotch in an onion field that was stressed by salt. There are quite a few chemical control options available that are registered in Utah. One thing you want to make sure when you apply chemical products is that you look at that FRAC code that gives you the fungicide class that this particular fungicide is in and you want to rotate between different classes, not just between products. So if you look at um, Luna Tranquility, it actually contains two components, but it has a FRAC 7, which is the fluopyram. And then if you look at the boscolid down here, Endura also has a FRAC 7. So these two chemicals would be in the same chemical class. So you want to rotate to something else 
let's say you go to tilt after you apply boscolate because they're in two different um, chemical classes, so you avoid development of resistance. So it's not rotation between different products, it's rotation between different fungicide classes. And the label will normally tell you which fungicide class a product belongs to. So the other fungus that looks very similar to Altenaria leaf blotch is Stemphilium leaf blight. The only difference is that you don't get the purple discoloration on the leaves. And its alternate host is garlic. Symptoms also start in the older leaves late in the season. It's a weak pathogen. It will affect stressed plants just like the Altenaria. The symptoms again are lens shaped lesions and you also get concentric rings of black spores. And the spores are also visible with a strong hand lens. However, those spores are square and they, use like, they look like a package that's tied up with string. And the leaves turn brown and dry up. And again, you get reduced bulb size. Here are some lesions. So here's, for comparison, here's the purple blotch. And then here on the left, you have the Stemphilium leaf blight. And the chemical control options for Stemphilium are very similar to what you use for Altenaria leaf blotch. Pink root is very common in Utah, especially if onions are grown continuously. It's a root rot that caused by Foma terrestris. It has alternate hosts, including small grains and corn. You won't see symptoms on those, but the fungus can survive there until you bring onions back in. So if you do rotate, you want, do not want to include small grains or corn either. The symptoms, as the name implies, the roots become pink and dark purple. The roots will also decay and then you get new roots to develop. So the plants normally don't die. They just appear very nutrient deficient. They're stunted and the bulbs are small. And so up front here, you can see an infected bulb compared to the healthier bulbs in the background here. And then you see that pink discoloration and that's very easily visible. You do not need a hand lens or anything. You pull the onion out and you'll see the pink root. Management for pink root is crop rotation for three to six years. Maintain healthy and vigorous plants and use resistant varieties if they are available. Resistance can vary from field to field because there are different strains of pink root and they could be different in your field versus the field where they developed the resistant varieties in. And if you have temperatures above 82 degrees Fahrenheit, the resistance is reduced in resistant varieties. So you could still get infection even though you have a variety that's resistant. I'll move from the fungi to the viruses. Iris yellow spot virus had been a, a problem for years. When I first started here, almost 11 years ago, it was one of the major diseases in onions. Now lately, it has not been as much of a problem. Iris yellow spot virus is transmitted by onion thrips. And I believe Nick will talk about thrips later. So I'll just show you a picture down here. And if you have never seen a thrips, if you see an orange speck of dust that runs on your leaves, that's a thrips. Thrips acquire the virus as first and second stage larvae. So they have to grow up on an infected plant. They cannot acquire, as well, I shouldn't say they cannot acquire. Adult thrips can acquire the virus, but they're not able to transmit it. Only thrips that acquire the virus as larvae are able to transmit the virus. The larvae cannot fly. So the, and the adult thrips lay eggs on IYSV infected plants. The larvae acquire the virus. And then the onion thrips, once the larvae are adults, they move to other plants. 
And the onion thrips feed on many plant species, including a lot of weeds. And there are weed hosts, but most of the times weeds do not show symptoms. So you will never know that a weed is infected with iris yellow spot virus or most other viruses. The symptoms you see are these diamond shaped lesions. Sometimes they have a green island. And if you get early infection, these lesions will coalesce and the whole leaf will die. And just like with Alternaria or Stemphilium, you get small bulbs. You can eat the bulbs, they're perfectly fine. They're just small. And as a commercial grower, usually you get more money for larger bulbs. Irish yellow spot virus has a limited host range. It goes to allium species, ornamentals like irises and lysianthus that are also in the allium family, and as well as some weeds. In Utah so far, it has been green foxtail and two scale salt brush that has been identified. In other places like Georgia, we've also had um, South thistle being a host, as well as some of the other weeds. Not, very, not as many as some of the other viruses, but there are quite a few. Viruses survive the winter in thrips. The thrips go underground and they just feed on roots of perennial plants. And they also overwinter in volunteer onions or in infected onion bulbs that are in cull piles, as well as in weeds. So if you have infected bulbs on the cull pile in the spring, those bulbs usually grow shoots and those shoots will be infected with the virus and you have thrips emerging from the soil or even overwintering in some of those bulbs as well. Then they feed on those infected bulbs, lay eggs, the larvae feed on those leaves from those bulbs and then they move into the onion fields and spread the virus. And in some cases, if the cull pile is right next to the onion field, you can see the virus move from the cull pile into the onions towards the center of the field. If overwintering thrips lay the eggs on infected plants, like I said, then the larvae acquire the virus and then the adults move to the onions, feed and transmit the virus. Now getting away from the diseases, we'll talk about the invasive leaf miner. You might have heard me talk about it before. A few years ago, allium leaf miner was detected in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New York. And it has a, a narrow host range as far as it's known. It's leeks, onion, garlic, green onion, and chives. And the symptoms that you see is that the leaves are distorted. You do not necessarily get these um, mines that you see with other leaf miners, but you see distorted leaves and then the eggs are laid in these white lines that you can see on those leaves. You do get some feeding on the leaves, so occasionally you will see mines, but the main problem with this particular leaf miner is it's not just staying in the leaves, it actually goes into the bulbs. Here you can see the pupa that are on the onions. Here, this is the necker area of an onion. You have to peel it apart to find the pupa. The allium leaf miner overwinters as pupa in the soil. Then it emerges in March to April, possibly in May, depending on the weather. And then the larvae develop into pupa that then undergo a diapause over the summer. So this leaf miner is only active in the spring and then again in the fall, not in the summer. And then the adults emerge September, October, usually when we harvest our onions in September. They lay eggs and then the pupa will overwinter again. So far, this leaf miner has not been found in Utah. And we do a survey for, for it every year. So if you see a leaf miner of any sort in your onions, send us leaves so we can 
check which leaf miner it is. We do have leaf miner in Utah, but they're different species and they just stay in the leaves. There are chemical control options available. You can see those down here that you could apply if, if needed, but hopefully this leaf miner will stay out of Utah. So the species of leaf miner that we have is Liriomyza. We haven't been able to get it to a species yet. We found them in Cache, Davis and Box Elder counties. One year we also found the rice leaf miner in one field, Hydrelia chryseola, and it looks, symptoms look very similar to the Liriomyza. You get these galleries and mines in those leaves, but it will not our leaf miner that we have so far will not go into the bulb. So here you can see those galleries that we're looking for. That's what we normally see in our onions. If you see any of that, since the allium leaf miner occasionally does cause these galleries as well, just plug a few leaves and send them to us and then we'll see if there's still a larvae in there. And then we can test them and identify which one it is. And you can buy those leaf miners at the store. Um, I frequently see them and have picked them out. And they are also those same leaf miner species that we found in Utah so far. And so any leaf miner on onions that you see, if you see leaf miner on weeds, alfalfa and any other vegetable except for beets and spinach. I had a lot of leaf miners from beets and spinach. I think we're good on those. But if you see them on anything else, please send them to us. There's no charge for checking leaf miner samples. And if you have any questions, you can contact me or Nick. And then um, we'll let you know which leaf miner we find in your in your crops. And let me talk briefly about bulb mites since I mentioned those. They are white, large soil borne mites. And they oftentimes you can find them on a bulb, especially in fields that have been in corn or small grains. And they will eat the base right at the basal plate. There will be no roots left, the plants will wilt. You pick up the bulb and you look on the underside and you see these white, glistening, blister-like creatures crawling around. And if you have a strong hand lens, you can see them. They, those are the bulb mites. And they can sometimes cause quite a bit of damage. And that is all that I have. Thank you, Claudia. So we do have one question. This is more of a production question, but it's interesting. Chris asked, how long are onions typically in storage prior to getting to the stores? Uh, that's a good question. That depends on the grower. Between four weeks and three months, I would say. Right. But usually most growers try to sell as fast as possible. Okay. So Virgil asked, what about cutworms? That is you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Chris, I'm not gonna talk about cutworms tonight, but we actually talked about cutworms in our last two presentations, um, leafy greens and root crops. So if you wanna reference those videos, we list kind of the biology, um, the life cycle description, and then some management options. So. Go ahead and rewatch some of those videos. So now we're gonna move on to the next part of our presentation. And I was just gonna offer, so whoever finds a leaf miner in their onions, you can win the Utah Vegetable Production and Pest Management Guide. It has to be a confirmed leaf miner in the onion to win. So like Claudia said, be on Only the, the allium leaf miner or any leaf? Any leaf miner and onions. They find a leaf miner in their onions. They can okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So yeah, 
be on the lookout this spring in your own gardens, in your neighbor's gardens. If you're out hiking in the mountains and you see a leaf miner, I'm sure Claudia will take that. Yeah, if you find one in wild onions, even if you find one in ornamental onions, you know, anything in an allium family could be a potential host. They do not know how this allium leaf miner got into the US. They're still trying to figure that part out. <laughs> cool. So before we move into my portion, I have a few fun facts I was going to share for this intermission. In 2002, the Utah state legislator named the Spanish sweet onion as the official state vegetable. And between Utah, Colorado, Idaho, and Eastern Oregon, there is over 33,000 acres of commercial onion production. And that's between all the states. And we have quite a bit of commercial production onion here too in Northern Utah, if you weren't aware. I think believe prim primarily in Davis and Box Elder counties. And then what I'm gonna talk about next is our one of the most problematic insects of Utah onion production, and that is the onion thrips. So let's talk about onion thrips. So a complete generation of onion thrips requires three to four weeks. So we'll usually see these little guys during the summer months, and they can have about five to eight generations every single year. Um, so the picture on the right, that's the adult and the adults are the life stage that overwinter and they cause the majority of the feeding damage. And like Claudia was saying earlier, they are very small. They are only 1.5 millimeters long and you need a hand lens to get a good look at one. So if you have yellow sticky traps, the smallest insect that you'll see on there is probably a thrips. And if you're looking at plants close up and you see that little tan orange speck of dust moving, that's probably a thrips. And these thrips, they have yellow to brown tan bodies and they have two pairs of fringed wings, which are those kind of hairy looking wings you can see. So if you look closely at their antennas, they have seven little segments. And onion thrips are actually partho, parthogenic, so, or parthenogenic, sorry, that's the word. And that means they reproduce asexually and they're only females. You will rarely find a male onion thrip, which is interesting. And they will actually lay their eggs inside the onion foliage. So if you look at that picture on the left, this is a stained thrips eggs just because it's so tiny and that's the best way to see it and eggs will hatch in five to ten days and then they'll develop through two different larval stages or instars we call them so if you look at that bottom or i guess if you look in the top middle picture too you can see the early instar and then you can see the second instar and then i show show the diagram in the bottom left as well and these larval stages, they resemble the adults, but they don't have the wings. So thrips, they prefer to feed on newly emerged leaves, usually in the center of the onion necks. And it's usually under crowded conditions. And then they'll, so, or sorry, when, they're, when they start to become crowded, then they'll start to move up towards the tip of the onion to feed. Both the adults and larval thrips, they feed um, within the mesophyll layers using a punch and suck motion feeding. And the mouth parts, they're kind of beak shape. So it's almost like they're scraping the foliage with their kind of like this mandible tooth mouth part. And I did find a diagram online. So you can look in the bottom left area. That's kind of a enlarged image of what the thrips mouth part looks like. And this beak and mandible is thrust forward to puncture the leaf epidermis and then it sucks up sap. So that's what they're eating. But this can injure the plant cells. And basically this removal of the chlorophyll causes the feeding area to appear white to silvery in color. And you can see this middle picture. 
all these silvery specks, that's from thrips feeding on the onion foliage. And areas of leaf injury can occur in patches or streaks. And then when the feeding injury is severe, the leaves will start to wither and die back. And sometimes the thrips will leave tiny little black tar spots, which is their um, poop. So the thrip, thrips excrement. And you look at that bottom right photo, you can see where it's feeding and then leaving the excrements. So another issue from the thrips feeding could be water loss through the damaged leaf surface. This can cause a lot of stress to the plant and affect its growth. The feeding sites may allow entry of diseases and this is usually under the dry, but usually under the dry summer conditions of Utah, we don't get a lot of that. And then onions are most sensitive to thrips during the rapid bulb enlargement phase, which is usually around late July and early August and here in Northern Utah. And then the yield reduction due to this bulb size is the primary crop loss due to onion thrips. And then accelerated plant maturity due to thrips injury may transcute at the bulb growth period. And then following harvest and during storage, thrips can continue to feed on the bulbs, causing scars and reduce the quality and aesthetic appearance of the bulbs. So another species of pest thrips that we have here on our onions in Utah is the Western flower thrip. So way back in, I think the 90s, they did um, a survey monitoring different thrip species. And they actually found that the Western flower thrips were 10 to 100 times lower than the onion thrips. So they're kind of second place by, by a long slot, a long shot. But regardless, they're still here, so we'll talk about them. And what makes them different is they're slightly longer. So they're two millimeters long instead of the 1.5 millimeters. And they have a darker color than the onion thrips. And if you look at their antennas really closely, they have eight segments instead of seven. Now the Western flower thrips, they reproduce sexually, not asexually. So that means we have both male and females. And then the Western flower thrips densities in onions is usually higher in the late summer, similar to the onion thrips. And I did show a picture of their life cycle, pretty much the same thing. They develop through uh, two different instar stages. So in terms of managing thrips, we just talk about managing all thrips the same because they have really similar life cycles. Now, if you um, have a large field operation, if you grow a ton of onions, monitoring thrips is super important. And you can do this by sampling. So thrip sampling is important to optimize the management strategies and to better understand the thrips population pressure over time. So sampling should begin when plants have at least four to five leaves by mid-June then an effective sampling method for pest management decision is in the counts. So if you look in this top picture, what, what they're doing is they're opening kind of the leaves and looking on the inside. And that's where they're counting the thrips. And you wanna do that quickly before they disperse or hide. Then the majority of thrips will be at the base of the youngest leaves in the lower center of the neck. So I included a picture of a hand lens, which is something that we use when we're out pest scouting. And it just magnifies and makes the smaller insects like thrips easier to see. And then I included a diagram of how you should sample. So like in this picture on the right, when you have a large field like this, you don't want to just sample in one spot. You want to kind of pick random spots, but you want to have a good coverage of the area, area you're sampling. Because thrip populations might be greater near the field edges where there's nearby weeds and there might be less thrips in the center of the field. So it's important you wanna get a good um, sampling of the whole field. So now let's talk about managing our thrips. One of the best things we can do, especially for our large growers is to at all costs, avoid planting 
um, our onions near adjacent grains or alfalfa fields, which can be a challenge. But we, we say this because adult thrips, they like to overwinter in these crops. And that close proximity can make it easy for them to migrate to the onions in the summertime. And it increases the survival of the overwintering thrips, especially like this summer, we had a mild and dry um, winter. So that might lead to an interesting season for pests this summer. Small grains and alfalfa are common rotational crops for onion. So it, it might be hard to, it might be difficult to implement this recommendation. And then another thing to consider, like I have shown in the left diagram, is to plant your younger fields upwind relative to the prevailing winds from the older fields. And this allows for the adult, or this makes it difficult for the adult thrips to move to the younger ones because the wind is going to blow them in the opposite direction. And that'll lead to less infestation in these younger onion fields. So, what I've seen a lot of like the smaller, more urban farms do is they use straw or other mulch and they put them as like a plant bed on the bottom. And this has actually been shown to help reduce thrip populations and improve the onion growth. And then other benefits of using kind of a mulch or straw is weed suppression. Obviously it can reduce soil mo moisture loss, reduce soil erosion, and it can help improve the soil organic matter. And then the effects of mulch on the thrips can include, include increased biological control, control through enhancements of predator populations. And then it can create a barrier on the soil, which will prevent those pre-pupa and pupae from getting down there, which is the resting life stage of thrips. So basically you're just blocking the thrips from getting to the soil. And then I've seen a lot of our commercial growers do this, especially down in Utah County is sprinkler irrigation, which can have its pros and cons because we know when you do overhead irrigation that can lead to a lot of potential um, fungal and disease spread. But in terms of managing thrips, it's actually helpful because overhead irrigation or overhead sprinkler irrigation has been shown to reduce the population on onion plants. Because basically the physical action of the water is washing the thrips from the plant. And then the water droplets standing on the leaf surface can um, inhibit the thrips. Because thrips, they prefer dry conditions, so they're not going to like that water. In addition, water applied through sprinklers can cause a crust to form on the soil later, which makes it harder for those pre-pupae and pupae to seek shelter in the soil. So let's talk about some biological control. Um, so predators of onion thrips, they can be numerous, but they're usually not in that much of abundance until the late summer after um, the majority of the thrips damage has already been done. And if you're spraying a lot of um, pesticides that can also reduce the beneficial insect numbers as well. But some common predators that we do see, so if you're working in a home garden, this might be more of interest to you, but we do see um, big eyed bugs, um, which I have on the bottom left, the minute pirate bug, I have on the top right, and I actually found a photo of a minute pirate bug eating a thrips. And then green lacewing. So in the bottom right, you can see a picture of a little green lacewing larvae eating a thrips. And then there's actually predatory thrips too. I know there's a black hunter thrips, which will attack the bad thrips. And then there is a banded thrips like I have in this photo. Now, a lot of our con commercial growers, what they do is they'll consider um, insecticide options. And so I listed some products here and thrips can actually develop resistance. So like Claudia said earlier with the fungicides, how you wanna switch between, we call modes of actions. You wanna do the same things with thrips. 
So I listed some synthetic products, but I also listed some organic products as well that are labeled for thrips control. So like pyrethrin, spinosad, um, or potassium salts of fatty acid, and then some other biocontrol agents as well. But insecticide, even though it's the most common and despite the wide availability of products, like I said, there can be rapid development and resistance with these insecticides. And then the main reason is because of the short life history of onion thrips. So if you remember, I said there can be, I think like six to eight generations per year. And then because they develop asexually, the females, they're gonna pass on 100% of their genes to the offspring. So the ones that are resistant, they're going to give those stronger genes to the next generation. So that's why it's important to um, rotate between the insecticides. So that was all I had to talk about for thrips. And then like Claudia said, there's also the bulb mites and alien leaf miners. Those are something you want to look out for as well. So I'm going to share a few resources that I want all of you guys to go check out. The first one is our USU Extension Utah Pest website, which is brand new. It looks great. There's tons of good resources on there. You can learn more about the Utah Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab, where you can send all your onions or other plant samples that have problems. We have a lot of educational how-to videos. You can check out our free guide ebooks, our fact sheets, and you can go back and watch some old recorded webinar presentations like this one. And then if you're not already, you need to be subscribed to our Utah Pest Advisories. These are timely alerts that get sent directly to your email and they'll tell you exactly what insects and diseases you need to be looking out for. And then we have those for fruit, vegetable, turf, and landscape. And then, like I was plugging earlier, we have our Utah Vegetable Production and Pest Management Guide. And you can actually get this free, a free PDF version online. And we have a whole comprehensive website to go along with it. But if you want a hard copy, you can get that at our USU Extension Store for $20. And then lastly, I'm a great resource myself. You can ask me questions, give me a call, send me an email. Um, we have our Facebook page, USU Extension Utah Pest, and our Instagram. Go ahead and send us pictures of any problems you're having. If you have a funky looking onion, send us a picture and we can help you figure out what's wrong with it.